it's basically about getting to work. <laughs> not just theorizing about it, not just thinking about it, but, but to actually think really hard and, and, and work with people who are enacting practices, new policies, new, new infrastructure, new you know, ways of being and doing things. I think it's definitely about shifting systems um, into something that's more, more desirable. I think that there's an interesting normative component to transformations when you talk about them from a sustainability perspective. And I think it's really looking at large-scale change that happens over time. It's an ongoing process, it's not an outcome. Transformación en la práctica implica eh, muchos aspectos, uh, transformaciones profundas que tienen que ver con cambios a nivel de la institucionalidad de, de, de nuestros países, eh, miradas distintas de ver las cosas, visiones diferentes de entender eh, el desarrollo, por ejemplo, eh, cambios profundos a nivel de relaciones. Entonces implican cambios personales, pero también cambios en estructuras, cambios en sistemas epistemológicos de conocimiento. It's not about teaching people anything. I think what we have to learn is that we need to create spaces for people to enter these questions and these processes from the knowledge systems that they exist in and build from there. Um, if you can work from that point, you can then start seeing what structural systems are not including them or making the change not possible or, or reducing their capacity for their knowledge to be expressed. I personally believe that if acceptance comes from individuals, first we have to have a buy-in that we need to transform ourselves, our own attitudes, our own uh, motivations need to change. What are we doing something for? What am I even talking about transformations for? Is it just because I want to see something else transformed or I also want to transform myself, my own consumption levels, my own way of looking at um, nature, other people. So um, if transformation has to really expand, it has to be at that level. Individuals reflecting upon first their own role and then I think collectives, people coming together, forming co collectives and a pressure coming from, from below. From a conflict transformation perspective, you have to engage with power and you have to transform power symmetries. So I work mostly from with indigenous communities, trying to help strengthen their own capacities to, dial, to, to engage in dialogue with other actors in, in a more equilibrium, in a, more, in a, in a condition of greater um, balance. And then I try to create links between indigenous communities and decision-making actors uh, that can produce change, uh, transformative change. Well, in Hebei, which is a neighbor, neighboring province of Beijing, and the, the heavy industry was considered as the main resource of air pollution in Beijing. So actually all the industries were shut off, were shut down in in Hebei province and millions of workers were laid off during the last three or four years. In, in this process, the social impact, apparently their livelihood is a very apparent social impact of that policy making and transformation process. But unfortunately, their livelihood has not been considered in policy evaluation. So what we are doing in China is trying to promote their voice can be heard by policy makers. Eh, estamos desarrollando un marco, un marco de análisis y hemos desarrollado algunas, a, algunas aproximaciones teóricas pero también prácticas eh, en, en casos concretos. En el caso concreto de Lomerío hemos eh, eh, tratado de generar procesos de, refle de reflexión, de construcción histórica de sus conocimientos, de visualización de sus escenarios futuros y eh, desde la academia tratar de acercar un poco más a los que hacen la política pública para que es, eh, la población indígena en específico pueda eh, generar transformaciones o saltos cualitativos de sus demandas a nivel de política pública. Our own example is in the food and agricultural system and we're looking at seed systems and what you're seeing there at the moment is a very rapid process of transformation but in an unsustainable direction seed market concentration and then a decline of diversity both of seed varieties and the kinds of farming systems that seed systems can support and so it's an unsustainable transformation that's actually happening very fast and so our 
project is about, trying to explore ways we can break that, put brakes on that, create a bit more space for diverse sets of practices and think about you know, novel directions for that sector. Well, we've been looking at something called uh, open source seed systems. It's basically trying to uh, create or even actually recreate a commons, a protected commons in this, in this case, in seeds, which allows the free movement of knowledge and germplasm. Um, and we actually think this is kind of a catalytic, potentially catalytic change because it opens up a lot of space for actors who want to be involved in seed breeding to get involved in ways that are closing down at the moment. The Alternatives Framework came about um, after a few years of engagement with the resistance and alternative movements. They were our organization and others who were involved with these movements who realized, who were trying to understand how coherent and how holistic these alternatives were. were. Were they really addressing all forms of inequity, all forms of injustice, all forms of violence, or they were only focusing on one particular conflict, context that they are working with? So for example, um, I work with forestry issues, so if you're fighting for rights of indigenous communities, so it's only about ecological rights or establishing your rights, but it's also about rights of um, uh, women, rights of nature, or is it also about establishing um, more sustainable livelihoods, is it also about political strengthening. So um, a few people got together and they decided that there needs to be a kind of framework which helps us understand how holistic our uh, alternative initiative is. And that's where this framework comes from. It talks about five main spheres, um, the social sphere, economic sphere, political sphere, ecological sphere, and cultural sphere. So the idea is that people who are involved in resistance movements and uh, alternatives sit together and reflect how their movement or initiative is impacting all these different five spheres. The mapping uh, work that we do is called participatory mapping. It's uh, different from conventional forms of mapping. It's basically people mapping their reality, uh, people mapping their past, and their present, and the future. And it actually creates shock in people. When they compare the past and the present, it, 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 it creates shock. They know that their land is degrading, but they ascribe that to God or to, to government, you know, that somebody not doing the right thing. Uh, so the shock is when they, they compare the past and the present, they would realize how much they have lost in terms of the, uh, the critical natural environments like the rivers, the soil, the forest, wetlands, they were there, and the wild animals, they will realize that they have lost many things. And uh, it has happened because of mainly their action and also by, by the influence of the outside actors. So that, that, that shock is very much important. And based on that shock, then the new, a new reality will come out, a new identity, uh, a new realization. Based on that, then we do map of the future in two scenarios. One scenario is, is what would happen if business continues as usual? Yeah, what would happen? Where will we go? So they do map, they put it actually. So then that is chaos after chaos. It's a lot of chaos. Then an, another question is, what is the best future then? So they would they would put in the in the, in the future their vision, a transformative vision. That's where the transformation comes from. Then then you ask questions again. It takes time, depends, depends a lot, it, it is actually quite a, a um, context dependent situation, it depends a lot on the people that are around and keep, I think change happens a lot when you find the key people that you can connect with that are in the right place in the right time that can make those changes. So I think there's a really interesting angle here around scaling. So we think about transformation as happening when things get bigger and sort of then they can shift the system. But quite often a lot of the work that we've been doing with sort of some of these local niche actors is that actually the whole point of their existence is that they want to stay kind of small and local, they don't want to get bigger. And so I think that 
for me, actually looking at systemic transformation in the future is much more about these small pockets of change working in a network to a more polycentric fashion. Um, so you're still embedded within a local context, so you, you've got this, this link to the biosphere, to your community, to um, sort of those processes happening around you, but that there are still global linkages between uh, di different actors or different networks within this. So rather than we're going big into the multinational kind of level, um, sort of scaling up or even replicating, sort of, sort of scaling out, it's about what we call scaling deep, which is really about changing underlying values in the way that we go about doing things. And that's a very internal kind of behavior change or relationship change process. And I think that if we manage to get that right, um, then we will start to see some of these more transformative processes happening in the future. So to me, this is, this is the challenge and the opportunity that we have. So many boats are leaking. I mean, there's like no shortage of things we can do. And we need to work with the people who are affected to make it happen. So. That's where my hope comes from. That's what I want to see more of and fast.